So in 2112, our real focus is on looking at systems that are dynamic. So in other words, systems with some amount of energy storage, like so for instance, this RC circuit here, where I have a capacitor. So I can store energy in that capacitor. Whenever I have an energy storage system, I have a dynamic system, which means that it's behavior over time. So in other words, what the voltage looks like over time can be described using a differential equation like what we have right here. So every system we look at in 2112 basically comes down to something that is fundamentally time varying and thus fundamentally described as, as a differential equation. Now, as you guys know by this point in time, um, sinusoids are a special topic for us in electrical and computer engineering. And the reason is that because many of the signals that we have in the real world are sinusoidal. You know, for instance, audio signals, powered system waveforms, radio waves, etc. All of those things tend to be sinusoidal. So in this case, I've got my simple circuit and I say I've got a 10 cosine 100 T minus 30 degrees going into this circuit. Now again, first thing we learned is that I can figure out the output by solving the differential equation. That differential equation always has two components to its solution. The first of them is a transient solution. That transient solution reflects the fact that that capacitor fights off any change in energy storage that happens. So there's a transient response, and then there's a steady state response, and the steady state response reflects what the input is trying to do to the voltage here after the transient has sort of died off, okay? So what we know is that the transient response, this A e to the negative T over tau, that's gonna decay to zero if we wait long enough. So because the transient always decays, we give special emphasis to the steady state component. And there's essentially three methods that we can think of at least for trying to solve for what that steady state component is. And I've written out sort of the three of them here. So undetermined coefficients, phasers, and Laplace. Undetermined coefficients is basically what you guys learned in um, differential equations. In other words, I guess a particular solution. So I can guess a particular or steady state solution of the form B cosine omega T plus phi which in, in the context of differential equations, you probably did as some coefficient times cosine plus another coefficient times sine. If I go back and look at trig identities, I can figure out that, that these two things are equivalent to each other. All right, you went through and you guessed this. In other words, you popped this solution into this equation in addition to providing V in and then you basically solve for what B1 and B2 are and can solve for what B and phi are. All right, that's the math approach. But we said that given that our interest really only lies in the steady state solution, I could effectively make use of another approach that we called phasor analysis, where we said, all right, well, instead of V in of T, all right, I'm gonna represent the input by its phasor domain representation. So in other words, V in of T could be represented as a complex number with a magnitude V and an angle. So in this case, V is 10 volts and the angle is negative 30, okay? So if I took that approach, what we said was I could make simplifications for I equals C D V D T and V equals L D I D T. Basically what I found in, in this world here is that for a capacitor, <clears throat> the phasor on a capacitor is the capacitor voltage is equal to 1 over j omega c times ic, and for an inductor, vl equals j omega l times il, like that, okay? Well, this came out of the differential equation results, which are which is that i equals C D V D T and V equals L D I D T. In other words, by going into the phasor domain and only focusing on the steady state response, I got these simplifications that allowed us to write simple algebraic equations. Those algebraic equations were complex, but we didn't have to write differential equations anymore. So if I looked at a circuit like this one here, what we said was we had V in the phasor, 
okay, which is V angle negative 30 degrees in this case. I had R and I had C. And I wanted to find, in this case, I've called this V out, and I wanted to find its phasor. And what we said is if I find its phasor, I can transform that phasor back into the time domain. The critical element that we learn from differential equations is that if I have an input at a particular frequency, so in this case 100 radians per second, I know that the steady state voltage across this capacitor is going to have the same frequency. It's never going to change frequency. If my input is 100 radians per second, every other voltage and current in the circuit is going to have a frequency of 100 radians per second. Only the amplitude and the phase can change. We learned that from differential equations, and we use that result from differential equations to jump to phasors. Okay? So in this case, I had a much simpler approach where I just said, well, V out then is equal to, or the phasor for V out is equal to the phasor times V in, and I just did a voltage divider analysis. In other words, in this phasor world, all right, essentially what I said was I could just uh, use circuit analysis like I learned in circuits one and just apply that with impedance instead of resistance. So on top here, I have 1 over j omega c, that's the impedance of the capacitor, over the total impedance of the circuit, which is 1 over j omega c plus r. If I simplify that whole thing, it becomes simply j omega r c plus 1 and 1 on top times v in. You don't see how I got that. You can see, well, if I multiply by j omega c over j omega c, which is equivalent to multiplying by the number 1, I get the result that's shown here. Okay? All right, so what we did is we said, well, if I wanted to know what V out of T is, so if I want to know what the steady state solution for that is, the steady state solution would be the magnitude of V out, whatever that is, times cosine of omega t, the frequency didn't change, plus the angle of V out, the phasor, like that, okay? So let's go through this particular example. So in this case, I've got these numbers up top here, all right? So if we want to help ourselves, maybe we'll move that down here, okay? All right, so let's plug the numbers in. So for this guy here, I have 1 over j times, so omega is 100, okay, and c is 1 microfarad, and r is 1 mega ohm, plus 1, all times v in is equal to v out steady state. Okay, so that becomes 1 over J100 plus 1 times Vn. Now the phasor for Vn in this case, V negative 30 degrees. So if I look at this particular case here, I have times 10 with an angle of negative 30 degrees. So what do I do? Well, what I do here is I say, what's the magnitude, right? And what's the phase angle? So the magnitude would be the magnitude of the, of the top, which is 1, divided by the magnitude of the bottom, which is 100 squared plus 1 times 10. So if I do the math on that, that becomes 0 0.01 times 10, or 0 0.1. The angle of V out steady state, right, I get simply by combining the angles of this guy, this guy, and that phasor. So that's zero degrees for the number one, minus arctan of 100, so imaginary over real, minus the angle of this guy here. So angle of the top, plus the angle of this, minus the angle of this. If I go through that, I find this, this guy here is negative 89.4271 degrees minus 30. So that becomes negative 
which tells us that V out steady state of T, the steady state component, must be 0 0.1 cosine 100T. Frequency doesn't change, but the phase and the magnitude are changed. Okay. Now, in the Laplace world, I should be able to get the same result. What we showed, the critical result, was I can use the Laplace transform to show that the steady state component of the output is equal to the transfer function evaluated at S0 times the input. So in other words, if my input is basically a complex exponential, okay, a complex exponential, <clears throat> if I want to figure out the output, the steady state output of a system, the steady state output of a system is the transfer function evaluated at S0 times that complex exponential. So in this case, I gave the complex exponential an amplitude, okay, which is just a multiplier. Now, <clears throat> the idea of a complex exponential is not exactly the same thing as a sinusoid. But what you know, what you've talked about, is that in general, if I have a complex exponential, e to the j omega t, that is equal to cosine of omega t plus j sine of omega t. So sometimes what we do is we utilize complex exponentials to represent sine waves. Now that may sound kind of clunky and annoying, and, it, and maybe it kind of is a little bit, but it tends to greatly simplify the math that we have to do if we think of these sort of trigonometric functions as complex numbers. Ultimately, that makes math a lot simpler for us. So very often, it's easiest for you to think of e to the j omega t as effectively a sinusoid. All right? We can always relate e to the j omega t to a cosine or a sine by saying, let's take the real part of e to the j omega t, or let's take the imaginary part of e to the j omega t. So we use that here like so. I say v n of t is equal to v cosine omega t minus 30 degrees. Using Euler's identity, and if we're not sure how to do that, let's just write <clears throat> real quick, right? V cosine omega t minus 30 is the real part of V cosine of omega t minus 30 degrees plus J times V sine of omega t minus 30 degrees, like so, right? The real part of this expression is equal to what we started with. Well, that also has to be the real part of V e to the j omega t minus 30 degrees plus, well, no, like that. That's all I needed to write, right? So in other words, I took this guy right here and thought of it as theta, right? And I wrote V e to the j theta, all right? What I did here is I said, well, if I have e to the j omega t, let's write it like this, V e to the j omega t times e to the j negative 30, right? If I have exponential e to the a plus b, that's equal to e to the a times e to the b. That's what I did here, right? So essentially what I'm saying is I can think of my input if I have a cosine coming in. What, I, what I'm saying is I can think of that cosine as some complex number times e to the j omega t, and it's the real part of that, okay? So <clears throat> if you look at this, v e to the minus j 30, that's the same as the phasor we had right here. V angle negative 30 is the same as V e to the negative j 30, okay? So what I can say here is V out steady state of T is the real part of H of S times V in the phasor times e to the j omega t, okay? So it should be a pretty easy statement to say that if you, if you believe the proof that we gave of this statement, that it should be the case that the real part, the same would be true if I took the real part of both sides. In other words, the real part of the left equals the real part of the right, okay? So let's, let's apply that here, okay? So for the circuit that we have, so here was our circuit, right? 
for our circuit, we said, let's call this Vn of S. Call this R, call this C. Instead of one over J omega, I say one over SC. And here is V out of S. Okay, here's R. So I use the relationship again that I had for from circuits one, I use a voltage divider relationship to find V out of S. So V out of S equals V in of S. So that's just a, a voltage divider relationship times one over SC over one over SC plus R, right? So the impedance of the thing that I'm looking to find the voltage across over the total impedance in the circuit. Multiply top and bottom by SC and this becomes V in of S times 1 over SRC plus 1, okay? All right, what we said is that V out over V in, so in other words, just bringing V into the other side, we called that the transfer function, H of S, like so, okay? And what we said is, so using our result from up here, it should be the case that V out uh, steady state of T is equal to the real part of H of S. All right, <clears throat> and I should be careful. Real part of H of S evaluated at S naught. So um, times V in E to the J omega T, like that, okay? where the S naught value here is the particular value of S that I'm plugging in. So in other words, evaluated at S equal to J omega, okay? So let's expand that out. That's the real part of H of J omega. Well, so we just plug in H of S and let S equal to J omega. So if S equals J omega, I get J omega RC plus one times, in this case, the phasor for V in is 10 e to the negative j 30 degrees times e to the j 100 t like so okay so if you look at that this part of the expression right here is the exact same thing that i have written right here okay if i plug in numbers for everything i get real part of 1 over j 100 plus 1 times 10 and i can write it the same way 10 angle negative 30 times e to the j 100 t, like that, okay? This here is the exact same thing I had right there. So I can write this as the real part of 0 0.01 times 10, all with an angle of negative 119.4271 times e to the j 100 t. In other words, what I've done is I've taken this expression right here, okay, and I have simplified it using the math that I already did. The magnitude of 1 over J100 plus 1, that magnitude is 0 0.01. The angle of this, of, of this guy here is negative 89.4271. The angle of this is negative 30, so their combined angle is negative 119.4271. So that means if I take the real part of this whole thing, it becomes 0 0.1 cosine of 100t minus 119.4271 degrees. The exact same result I got from using phasor analysis. So I show this only to provide context for the fact that uh, what we're doing is ultimately focusing on the steady state solution to a differential equation, which we can do in the math format. But we can exploit the math result. So the math result basically told us that I have a sine wave as the input, then the output, or really all the voltages and currents in the circuit are gonna have the same frequency. That led us, led us to go to phasor analysis, and ultimately allows us to go to this Laplace result, which is a special result only in the case that I have complex exponential inputs, okay? And because of this special relationship between complex exponentials, the special relationship meaning Euler's identity, 
Because of the special relationship between complex exponentials and sinusoids, we're allowed to basically say, all right, well, let's think of our input, which is a cosine. Let's just think of our input as a complex exponential. And then in the end, take the real part. And that allows us to make this jump. Now, as we'll see, these are effectively the same analysis now. There's nothing different between phasor analysis and Laplace analysis, but it allows us to, to be able to do some things in some interesting and unique ways.